In this series of tutorials, we're going to look at how we can use Model Builder to automate a series of geoprocessing tasks. Model Builder can be particularly valuable when the series of tasks are complicated or when the process needs to be repeated and may take a long time or is tedious. In the example that we're going to see here, we're going to use Boston 311 data in our geoprocessing model. The City of Boston has a program that allows constituents or employees to report problems across the city from graffiti and potholes to crime. We want to take that data and map it across the city and specifically aggregate it by neighborhood and measure it in a standardized way. In this case, reports per square mile, reports per person, and the percentage of reports that haven't been addressed in a timely manner. We can acquire the City of Boston's 311 data online through its Open Data Initiative. And these, uh, this data can be acquired as a series of CSV or comma separated values files that are downloaded, essentially text files uh, that are uh, tabular data in text file format. Before starting to build our model, we need to get very clear on the steps that will need to be taken to achieve our goal. So the first thing that you normally do is to walk through the steps in ArcMap interactively, identifying along the way the tools that you'll need to use. This is going to be the uh, way that you understand what you'll need to do in, mo in the model builder. However, keep in mind that the process, uh, the, the processing tasks in Model Builder are not exactly the same as the ones that you would do interactively in ArcMap. Um, and so it may take a little bit of time to figure out exactly the sequence of steps and the particular tools you'll need to achieve your goal. But it's fairly similar, and once you've, you know where you need to head, it makes it a lot easier. So I've downloaded the Boston 311 data as, again, a series of CSV files. Um, and you can see here that um, they can be open in Excel, but we're not going to be doing that in this case. Um, these files are fairly large, so even though they're text files, we're talking about files that are 25 and up to 100 megabytes in size. So it may be a little slow processing. In ArcMap, I've made a connection to the folder in which, which contains this data. In particular, you can see the data folder here in all of the CSV files. So in order to build a model builder, we need to create a toolbox. Um, the model will reside in the toolbox, and the toolbox itself needs to reside either in a folder or in a geodatabase. So I'm going to create a geodatabase in my folder here. Within the geodatabase, I'm going to create a new toolbox. And within that toolbox, I'm going to create a new model. When I do that, it opens up the model builder window. The model that we create is essentially going to be eventually a tool that resides in the toolbox, and it works almost like any other tool that you might access through our toolbox to do other processes. In fact, later on, we can integrate this tool that we create uh, into ArcMap's interface uh, in a way that's very similar to the other tools. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing that we want to do in this case is we want to set the geoprocessing environment so that we know where all the data is going to be going. So from the top menu bar, we're going to go to geoprocessing environments, and we're going to set the workspace so that it works in the geo in the, into that geodatabase that I just created. That's important because it indicates where the data is going to go, and I can find it, and I know uh, um, where the default will be. In addition, I want to check my geoprocessing options uh, to ensure that all the output are overwritten automatically. And this is important because we're going to have to run the model numerous times before we get it to work, and we don't want to get errors from um, um, attempts to overwrite something that can't be overwritten. All right, with the environment set, we can start assembling our process. So Model Builder works by using the tools that are available in the Arc Toolbox. So we'll open the Arc Toolbox, and we'll see our all the available tools that we'll be using. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to bring in that table, uh, that we one of the tables that we downloaded. So we could take that table directly into most of uh, our tools. And so in this case, we want to plot the locations of 311 calls. And we could plot them directly, but it's actually safer in this case to um, import the table uh, as a table into our geodatabase and because it allow us to control how ARC interprets the fields in that table. ARC can be a little unpredictable at times in terms of how it interprets fields from uh, tables that are brought in. So under the conversion tools toolbox we're looking into the to geodatabase and specifically the table to table tool. 
So I'm going to drag that tool into the Model Builder window. And what you see when you do that is are two things. One is the tool itself, the process, and then what will be the variable of the output of that process. When you hover over any, pro any tool, you're going to see that it shows you the parameters of that tool. You know what you're going to need to fill in. And so the way we start this process is we double click on the table and we access its parameters and we're going to specify the input table. So I'm going to click on the find tool. I'm going to navigate to the folder containing my downloaded text files. I choose the 2011 data for this instance. I need to specify the output location. So in this case, we're going to using that geodatabase as our output location. And then finally, we need to give it a name. So the output table will have a, a name. Okay. Now, in this case, too, what we're in the reason I use this tool is I want to control how Arc interprets the table as it brings it in. And so the field map here on the lower part of this dialog window is, is where we're going to manipulate that. So as I look down the list of fields that are in that table that I'm going to import, I can see very quickly how ARC is interpreting the form or the type of that field. And I can already see that some of these are not correct. Um, and I know this only because I've gotten very familiar with my data, which is something that you should always do. You should be as familiar with your data as possible be before trying to process it because you're going to end up diagnosing problems. Uh, and it helps to know what you're dealing with. So in this case, the case inquiry ID column is actually a unique ID column. It should not be a number. It should be a text. So I'm going to right click on that to access the properties. And I'm going to change the type to text. And I need to ensure that it's long enough to accommodate all the text that's in that field. And so in this case, I know that it's at least 12 characters in length. So then I hit the tab to accept that. Hit OK. I'm also going to check on one field that I know contains very long text to make sure that the text uh, feels long enough. If you're working in earlier versions of ARC, I'm working with 10.3 here, you'll need to be cautious about this because sometimes the default is smaller than you need. So I'm going to check it just to make sure and I can see that it's the length is appropriate, about 8,000 characters, which is plenty long. Um, so that's good. And then I'm going to scroll, scroll down a bit. And I see one more, my property ID here should again be unique IDs that are text. And this one is again being interpreted as a number. So I need to change that. Change the type to text. And the length here, I'm going to make it a little longer than necessary just to be safe. Hit OK. All right. Now it looks like all of our settings are correct. And when I do that, what you'll see is that the a couple things happen to my model builder. Um, one, all of the uh, processes and output variables uh, are colored uh, in solidly, and this means it's in a ready run state. So it's ready to be executed. Um, when it's hollow initially, it means it's not ready to run clearly. But in addition, you'll see two items have been added: these blue um, ellipses and these uh, ellipses, and these indicate input. Um, into the mod, into the tool. So here is my CSV file, and here is the geodatabase output location. All of which are going to produce a new file on the other end. Now the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to take this output, and then I'm going to plot it uh, as a series of points. So at that point, what I need to do is take it and bring in another tool. So in order to convert um, a table of points to, um, or excuse me, a table of locations into points. I'm going to be accessing a tool to create an XY event theme, and that's it. Uh, done through the data management tools, um, layers and table views, and then make XY event layer. If you didn't know where this tool could be found, you could always use the search function uh, on the side tab here and look for that particular uh, tool, although again, it helps to know what it is that you're looking for. In this case, uh, I know what I'm looking for, so I'm going to pull this tool into Model Builder. And you can see, again, just to emphasize the point, the, uh, the, the items here are hollow, which means they're not in a ready-run state. So we're going to need to fill in the, the requisite parameters in order to run this. So what we'll do is we'll, I'll double-click again on this tool, and I'm going to specify the incoming XY table. And so when I choose the drop-down list, I'm going to see right off the bat that I have two options with an interesting icon next to this kind of blue recycle um, symbol. Um, and 
this is going to show up repeated, uh, uh, repeatedly as we go through and build our model. And it indicates items that are available to us within the model process. And the value of this is that um, these, a lot of times these items, well, they frequently don't exist yet technically, but they do in terms of the process model. And so they're available so that you can chain together, chain, chain together the geoprocessing tasks. Um, you could navigate to them, of course, uh, if they already exist. But in this case, the point is to, to make those connections amongst the geo, in, within the model itself. So I'll choose that item. It automatically finds the uh, longitude and latitude files. And then I make sure, verify that the spatial reference is set correctly. And this is, of course, vital because otherwise your points will not be set into the right location. Um, if you had other data that was already loaded, this could obviously be affected. So you want to always double check that. So I'll hit OK. And you'll see right off the bat that when I do that, it, the linkage is made between the, the last item and this new item. Uh, interestingly, you can connect those items manually using this tool here by simply drawing a line between the two tools, would, which would accomplish the same thing, although you frequently need to access the parameters to make sure that all the items are filled in. Okay, so with our um, sequence of tasks attached, we actually can run this model at this point. And so in order to run a model, you just hit the Run button. When the process is completed, you'll see that it says completed. Um, this dialog right here is very important because um, as you're working to build your model, you're going to be making mistakes usually, and this will diagnose them. Uh, mistakes will appear in red, and you can go through and look at the series of tasks that were, that were performed and kind of diagnose where something went wrong. In this case, nothing went wrong, so we're good. So I'll close that. And now when we look at our model, we can see that, there, that the um, tools and the outputs are shadowed, which means the model has been run. Um, and so if we wanted to, we could actually display the product of this model by, simple, by going to the output that we want to see, right-clicking on it, and choosing Add to Display. And what that does is it allows us to see the product of our work. And so here we're seeing, let me minimize this out of the way, um, the... Uh, 311 reports across the city of Boston. And in this case, we've got oh, close to 60,000 points that we're looking at here. So it's quite a lot of data. And in fact, the process uh, might feel a little slow. Um, but it's going to be nice because we can automate this. So at this point, we've um, managed to construct a very basic model and model builder. We see how it works from that point. Uh, the nice thing is we can rerun this repeatedly. In fact, if we were going to um, continue working on this, which we will be doing, we don't actually need to work with the output yet, but it's nice to check on it. So I'm going to uncheck Add Display, and I'm going to remove this from here since we're going to be going forward. Um, in order to, to run this again, I would simply uh, validate the entire model, which will clear it, and you'll see the shadows disappear, and it's ready to run again. Um, whenever we're creating a model, we want to document this and begin to save it. So I'm going to go to the Model uh, option on the top menu and go to Model Properties. And I'm going to give it a name and a label. The name is the actual file name, and so this name uh, can't have any spaces in it. So I'm going to call it, call it Boston 311 Analysis, but no spaces. The label can have spaces, and this is what you'll see when you look in um, our catalog. And that's what you'll see. And the description is really important. I want to store relative path names because I know in the future if I move the um, geodatabase or the model toolbox, I want it to be able to find the data again. So I'll hit OK, save the model. You'll see too when you look in catalog that I see my model has been renamed with the label that I applied. So in the next video, we're going to go over how to continue to work on this model to build in the other processes.